There we go. So if you have any comments or questions while this is going along and uh, Roberto is providing his remarks, please just type any, any comments or questions you have into the chat area and we'll get to those later on. Um, I want to show you a, a screen real quick and we'll bring you around the world. In fact, I wanna show you one thing that uh, we are in the US right now, but today's presentation will be focused on the stands. These countries out here and a book that Doug will mention, you can find on Amazon. So this is the book that our guest speaker, Roberto Cormack has written. If you want to take a look at that and, and order a copy, you can find it on Amazon right there. Um, Doug is going to introduce Roberto, but I wanted to mention that I have a personal or professional connection to Roberto, uh, having served with him in the Civil Affairs Unit in Maryland, uh, which was led by Colonel Spuden, who's one of our attendees. So welcome, sir. And uh, thank you very much for your expertise, Roberto. Thank you very much for what you did on the team and uh, what you continue to contribute to the Army Reserve. So without further ado, I want to turn this over to Doug Hurst. Thanks, John. Um, I'm always interested and excited when we, we host these, uh, this one particularly because back a few years ago, I was a CASA desk officer at uh, U.S. Army Central. So I spent quite a bit of time in this Central Asia, and so I'm excited to receive this update of maybe what is going on since the last time I visited. Uh, our speaker today, Roberta Carmack, is a Central Asia analyst with U.S. government, has a PhD in Central Asian history from UW-Madison, and in 2019 published the book that John just brought up on the screen and talked to us about. His current research focuses on foreign and military policies in the Central Asian countries. So with that, Roberto, I will turn it over to you. Hey, thanks so much, John and Doug, for that introduction. And uh, many thanks for, to Third Order Effects for having me on today. It's a, really a pleasure to talk to you all today about the pandemic situation and its impact on the stands of Central Asia. You know, this is not a region that receives widespread coverage in mainstream U.S. media, but it's important nevertheless after all, the U.S. does have significant interests in the region. Uh, obviously, CENTCOM is very much concerned with what happens here. But more generally, the U.S. government has made it clear that the region is an arena for great power competition with the Russians and the Chinese, who in many ways are still militarily and economically dominant in the region. Not only that, but we have to keep in mind that three of these countries Tajikistan, Turkmenistan, and Uzbekistan directly border Afghanistan, and they're going to influence the ongoing Afghan peace process and vice versa. So it's important that we understand how the pandemic crisis is influencing the region as a whole. Um, this is going to be obviously a brief talk, but there are three major points that I want to hit on today that I believe are the most significant factors at play. One, I want to emphasize that Central Asia has become a major flashpoint for the COVID-19 pandemic. And it's really one of the hardest hit regions in the world per capita. The situation isn't quite as bad as in, say, India or Brazil, but it's still a very serious situation. As a result, the pandemic and the regional government's response to the crisis is probably going to decrease public confidence and regional governments. And this could lead to social and political instability down the line. And finally, when we look at the international dimensions of the pandemic, I would argue that the pandemic is probably going to help consolidate Russian and Chinese influence in the region, which is already strong, uh, which will make the job of the US to maintain its diplomatic, economic, and military influence in Central Asia that much more difficult. So what's going on exactly with the pandemic in Central Asia? As Doug mentioned, you know, I, I specialize in the region as a U.S. government analyst. So for the past couple of months, I've been uh, pretty neck deep in assessing and analyzing the impact of the pandemic on these countries. So surprisingly, the course of the pandemic in Central Asia has been pretty similar to how it's played out in the United States. Uh, Central Asian authorities in countries like Kazakhstan, uh, which borders on Russia, Uzbekistan, and Kyrgyzstan began announcing cases relatively late compared to the United States in mid to late March. But certainly by April, 
most of the countries of the region had acknowledged that coronavirus had entered their borders and began to implement effective quarantine restrictions. The only holdout here has been Turkmenistan. Turkmenistan is ruled by this kind of North Korea-esque dictator named Gorbanguly Berdimukhamedov, a uh, very eccentric and brutal individual uh, whose policies do not always align with reality. And he has not acknowledged the existence of COVID-19 in Turkmenistan, but um, journalistic and colloquial evidence indicates that it's widespread in that country as well. So the measures that were implemented in the rest of Central Asia in March and April were pretty similar to what the US government did and state governments did. Uh, businesses were closed down, public institutions were shuttered along with schools, and there were serious restrictions on mass gatherings. In Uzbekistan, in fact, about 85% of small businesses were closed down. So this was pretty substantial. And as can be expected, this severely damaged local economies as unemployment went through the roof along with inflation and uh, other indicators of economic dislocation. So by July, it did seem that the situation was under control. So these Central Asian countries opted to ease the quarantine restrictions and reopen the economies. And the results, unfortunately, were quite disastrous. About two weeks later, uh, COVID-19 cases spiked all over Central Asia. And by July, this had turned into a crisis. So it's kind of hard to quantify the scale of the epidemic in these countries, simply because the statistics coming out of Central Asia are very unreliable. Uh, there's plenty of evidence that for intentional and unintentional reasons, these governments have suppressed the true number of COVID-19 infections. Um, for example, by not counting anomalous pneumonia cases in Kazakhstan in the total number of COVID-19 cases. Uh, but, you know, these certainly are manifestations of COVID-19. Um, just to give you some idea, according to some reports, up to 40% of the inhabitants of the Kyrgyzstani capital of Bishkek have coronavirus antibodies, uh, and numbers might be similar in Uzbekistan and Kazakhstan as well. So it's difficult to overestimate the extent of the crisis in the countries. And the results have been pretty predictable. Now, these are post-Soviet countries. Their medical systems are at best okay in Kazakhstan and Uzbekistan, which are the wealthier countries of the region. Uh, you can compare their medical systems to maybe poorer countries in Eastern Europe, uh, like Slovenia or perhaps Bulgaria. But the countryside has never been covered by an effective uh, healthcare apparatus. So these countries are struggling to cope with the situation. Um, hospitals have been near or um, have run out of capacity. Medications have run out. People are able to get ambulances, so they're dying in their homes and in some cases on the streets. It's a bad situation. And recently, within the past week, some of these governments have given indications that the situation is stabilizing somewhat, that the number of cases has plateaued. It's hard to take that seriously, although it would kind of sync up with uh, global trends a bit. But, you know, we have to keep in mind that, like in the U.S., there is plenty of evidence that the pandemic is actually spreading to rural areas, leading to overburdened medical institutions and shortages of medications in isolated uh, rural localities. So the situation is far from over. So when we talk about the impact of the pandemic, we have to look at how the public is responding to what I would describe as a botch to reopening. Let's keep in mind that all of these countries, they're all authoritarian to one degree or another. Kyrgyzstan is sort of pseudo-democratic, although increasingly dictatorial. As I mentioned, Turkmenistan is a complete dictatorship. But in all these countries, people have very limited means to express grievances or discontent with the government. However, I would argue that the degree to which the government has botched the reopening will lead to public discontent. Um, one particular factor that's been giving people a lot of consternation is the fact that in Kazakhstan and Kyrgyzstan in particular, but probably throughout Central Asia, mid-level government authorities have started to embezzle 
uh, monetary and medical aid that was provided by the international community in order to uh, mitigate the coronavirus crisis. Um, in Kyrgyzstan, the president, Surumbay Jean Bekov, gave a recent talk to a prominent local radio station, and he overtly called government officials who embezzled medical supplies enemies of the people. So you know that if a Central Asian leader is channeling Joseph Stalin, there might be a serious problem here. And of course, you know, people are used to corruption in these countries. It's part of life there. It's how these governments function in many ways. But this might be a little bit different because now people are seeing that corruption is impacting their daily lives and those of their families. Immediate family members are dying because they're not getting medication in some cases because uh, supplies are being hoarded to sell on the black market or at bazaars at vastly inflated prices. And of course, the economic problems um, that have emerged because of quarantining in the COVID-19 crisis are not going to go away anytime soon. As I mentioned, employment in some countries has been going through the roof and is barely starting to recover. Um, and also decreased trade with regions like China, Russia, and even the European Union uh, will probably um, depress the gross national products of these countries for quite some time. Uh, growth estimates are way down. In some cases, like Kazakhstan, they were at 5%. Now they're at 1%. Tajikistan's at 1%. Uh, these are massive uh, shortfalls in projected economic incomes. And when it comes to the economic crisis, we also have to keep in mind that a sizable proportion of the populations of these countries, particularly Tajikistan and Kyrgyzstan, depend on the remittances of labor migrants who work in Moscow and other Russian cities to survive. Um, something like 35% of the Tajikistani economy is, um, or their GNP comes from the remittances of these workers. Uh, as Russian economic enterprises have shut down, these workers have not been able to send their money back to their families in Tajikistan, leading to massive shortfalls in the national budget. Uh, this is probably going to lead to discontent and future unemployment as well. So I'm not suggesting that this is a type of Arab Spring scenario where people are going to rise up and overthrow these governments. I consider that to be somewhat unlikely. What I am saying is this is probably going to be a cudgel that the haphazard and nascent opposition in some of these countries like Kyrgyzstan and Kazakhstan can use uh, to contest uh, national and regional governments. Finally, I do want to mention the situation as it has to do with this kind of trilateral um, relationship that exists between Russia, China, and Central Asia. As I hinted at, at the beginning of this presentation, uh, Russia is absolutely the dominant military power in this region. Three out of these, three out of the five Central Asian countries are members of the Collective Security Treaty Organization, which is sort of like the Russian version of NATO. Uh, the Russians had troops in Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, and Tajikistan, and still uh, control the economies of these countries in various ways. The Chinese, too, have greatly expanded their influence in Central Asia, especially especially within the past 10 years or so, as a vital um, node in his Built and Road Initiative. And the Chinese have invested millions, in some cases billions of dollars, into these countries. When it comes to the poorer countries like Kyrgyzstan and Tajikistan, uh, they've become almost completely beholden to the Chinese. Something like 40% of the Tajikistani national debt is owed directly to China and Chinese companies. So it's not surprising, given their already dominant position in the region, that the Russians and the Chinese were the first to offer uh, coronavirus-related aid. We're talking uh, cash in the form of monetary relief, PPE, and medical experts. Um, there's some evidence that the Russian aid was less than stellar quality. They donated tons of well, I should say tens of thousands of testing kits to Kazakhstan and Uzbekistan, but it turns out based on journalistic uh, stories that a lot of the Russian kits simply did not work. The Chinese aid, on the other hand, uh, seems to be working much better. Uh, the PPE is more effective, the testing kits work, and the expertise 
that's being literally flown into Central Asia has helped local governments mitigate the crisis and understand the nature of COVID-19 better. And this is something that Central Asian governments are very quick to acknowledge. Most of the presidents in this region have openly uh, thanked the international community for the aid that's been forthcoming. And yes, they think the IMF, to some degree the UN, but at the top of the list is Russia and China. And this is no accident. Uh, Central Asian leaders are essentially signaling that they too consider Russia and China to be the dominant power in the region. And they expect these two countries to help maintain a degree of stability in the region uh, by offering COVID-19 related aid. Um, other countries, of course, Turkey, uh, the Arab Gulf states and the United States have also offered assistance. Uh, but, you know, the governments, they, they've, they acknowledge it, but they don't focus on it nearly as much as the Russian and the Chinese aid. Um, this is unfortunate because, for example, a uh, United States Civil Affairs team uh, recently facilitated quite a lot of COVID-related aid to Tajikistan. Uh, this is something that local press picked up on, but not so much the national government. Uh, these governments are, for the most part, willing to acknowledge U.S. aid and cooperate with the U.S., but they're also afraid of antagonizing Moscow and Beijing. Uh, so public announcements about U.S. aid will not be extremely forthcoming. Finally, there are other more subtle ways that China, in particular, is taking advantage of the COVID-19 pandemic to expand its influence. As part of the mitigation measures uh, that Central Asian governments implemented in March and April, they began expanding surveillance networks to contain the spread of the pandemic. What I mean here is the installation of thermal cameras at major transportation nodes and the installation of smartphone apps to track people who have been infected with COVID-19 or who at least tested positive for it. Um, this in the short term and in the long term will almost certainly improve the ability of Central Asian governments to monitor people and suppress their populations if they show signs of dissent. Uh, that's a pretty matter of fact, short order effect. But in the future, um, we have to acknowledge that not coincidentally, much of this technology was developed and in many cases exported directly from China and from Chinese state companies. Uh, Huawei in particular has been at the forefront of helping Central Asian countries develop surveillance tech and import it. Um, I've seen no direct evidence that the, that the Chinese have the capacity to directly access these networks in order to, to collect intelligence. But, you know, it's entirely possible. And given the global controversy surrounding the expansion of, of Huawei networks, it's something that the United States is going to have to look out for in the future. And it's something that's going to uh, complicate U.S. efforts to maintain its diplomatic, economic, and military position in the region more generally. And with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Okay, great. Roberto, thank you very much. Uh, I know Doug uh, may be facilitating. If there are any comments or questions, uh, please type them into the chat area. My, uh, if I could uh, ask you a quick question about when you look at these countries, these five countries in Central Asia, um, and a virus that does not obey borders, um, some regions of the U.S. are some states in regions are banding together to have more coordinated responses. Do you see that in any of these countries? Are they working together to institute preventive measures or to coordinate? The short answer is no, not really. So interactions between the Central Asian countries are actually not at a very high level. Uh, there is a history of distrust over trade barriers and in some cases even borders. It's not like the Soviet period where they're all part of one single entity. Uh, really the only force that provides a degree of interaction and unity has been the Russian Federation, which is imposed basically by force. Um, yes, the president of Uzbekistan in particular, he's a reformer named Shavkat Mirziyoyev, who's been in office since 2016. He has made an effort to coordinate some sort of response. He's been quite active in having phone conversations 
with his Central Asian neighbors, and even in delivering aid, Uzbekistan has become something of a, uh, a powerhouse or a little powerhouse for distributing aid within the Central Asia region. But it's not at a comprehensive label, uh, level comparable to, say, the European Union. Central Asia is just not there yet. Okay. And when you look at a map, I'm going to show this again to everyone. Um, so with these five countries, who has, I mean, we care, the United States cares about these countries, but also we, we care about them not only directly, but because of China and because of Russia. Where are the people located? So when you talk about a virus that has vectors in humans, who has the most to gain or lose by helping the stands? Would it be China or Russia based on population and where people are for disease prevention or strategic gains? Mm -hmm. Russia has the most stake in preventing COVID-19 from spreading further from Asia. The level of migration and population movements between Russia and Asia is extremely high. The labor migrants I mentioned, this is millions of people. Students, uh, especially advanced graduate students from Central Asia, very commonly study in cities like Moscow and St. Petersburg. Um, so the Russians definitely believe, or I would assume they believe, it's only logical that they need to stem the tide of the pandemic in Central Asia or else it will probably lead or at least contribute to another wave of the pandemic in Russia where it's already quite bad. Uh, the Chinese too have a stake in the region. As you can see, Kazakhstan and Kyrgyzstan border Xinjiang province, which is a very restive province for the Chinese, very problematic. Um, there is trade between these two countries and the Xinjiang region. So they too uh, have a stake in preventing the pandemic from getting worse in Central Asia. Okay, great. Doug, Roberto, any comments or questions? Yeah, Roberto, um, uh, having been to Turkmenistan, I think three or four times myself, I can attest to the bizarre land that Turkmenistan is. Um, one of the things I'm curious about because the capital is so close to Iran and there is trade through there. Um, I can remember at my hotel many times staying there, seeing Iranian uh, cars in the parking lot. And it's been thought that Iran's numbers may be even three times higher than what's been reported. Do you have any information of that cross travel and if that's potentially uh, making the spread worse? So Turkmenistan was relatively quick in banning most forms of trade with Iran. You're right, before the pandemic, Turkmenistan and Iran had a very close mercantile relationship. Uh, a lot of goods uh, went back and forth between the two countries. Uh, now, you know, it's hard to get a clear indication of what Turkmenistan has been doing and what it plans to do, but it seems like trade was cut off pretty dramatically, which is definitely hurting the Turkmenistan economy. But uh, one would hope that it is helping to um, yeah, I want to say contain the spread of coronavirus from Iran, although that's unlikely. It's simply a mitigation measure that has been somewhat effective. Okay. And if you, I don't know if you can see the chat box, but you have a question from Scott in there. Any recommendations for U.S. military engagement with CA in light of COVID-19? Yeah, so the military question is an interesting one. Um, you know, when we assess U.S. military engagement and compare it, say, to Russian and Chinese engagement, uh, we have to acknowledge that a sinking tide lowers all boats. So, yes, uh, the U.S. has had to limit its military engagement with these countries, as have the Russians and the Chinese, most likely. Uh, for example, Step Eagle exercise for 2020 was canceled. It was supposed to be held last month. This is the annual uh, training exercise that's held between NATO and the Kazakhstani military. Um, John? No? Yes? Now he is. Hi. Somebody's unmuted there. Yeah, go ahead. Sorry. Um, but in terms of military engagement, I think civil affairs has the most significant role to play uh, in maintaining mill-to-mill -mill contact, especially with uh, these MODs. Uh, there are some subtle indications from the Kazakhstani MOD that they do appreciate COVID-19 related assistance. And really, you know, we're dealing with 
medical staff and epidemiologists that are mostly trained in the Soviet system. That doesn't mean they're completely incompetent. That's not true. But they do lack access to modern methods. So if civil affairs teams were to provide some sort of contemporary Western approach to understanding the COVID-19 uh, pandemic, how to assess symptoms, how to determine who's sick with what and what medications might be most effective. That is something most Central Asian countries would be receptive to, even if they don't openly acknowledge it in their press or in their, their public announcements. Roberto, John here. Uh, where, do you, where would you say that people listening and watching now should go for additional information about the pandemic impact on, on the stands. What are so trusted sources? The best resource that I've used is Radio Free Europe, Radio Liberty. It's uh, US funded and supported. Uh, and they use local journalists who are able to go out into these countries. They have their own source networks. And they give daily updates that are very good. They give updates in English and in Russian for those who speak Russian. Uh, that is the most reliable source. Another great website is Eurasianet.org. Um, it's one of the few English language websites that uh, does a really good job of really getting into the nitty gritty of Central Asia uh, current developments, including those that have to do with COVID-19. So those are the two resources that I would absolutely um, recommend that I use practically every day. Thank you. And uh, Doug, I think there's another comment or question that came in. Okay. Um, we got a question from Brandon White. It says, I missed the first few minutes, so this may have been described already, but have the Central Asian governments been honestly pub public about reporting the spread of the virus within the borders or to the general public, or do they distort the truth because admitting this would make them vulnerable to their authority? Can you touch on that a little bit? Have any additional comments? Yeah, yeah. Well, it's definitely the latter. Um, there are different degrees of opacity and openness in these countries, but I would say that none of them have been completely honest about it. Um, only now have these governments been interacting with the World Health Organization to try to convey a more accurate statistical picture of what's been happening. And even then, the numbers are suspiciously low, especially the death count. In some countries, it's like 100 people. That's way, way too low. It's probably more like thousands of people. Uh, unfortunately, this is simply because the governments are a little bit embarrassed. They feel that it will bring negative international attention, which will lead to uh, decreased foreign investment, decreased visitation, all that kind of thing. But no, you cannot trust what these governments are saying for the most part. Great. Well, this has been um, kind of like a walk down memory lane for me. Um, so I have very fond memories of my time in the stands. Um, I will wrap this up if we don't have any last minute questions. But are very uh, thankful for your time this afternoon. Um, this is continues to be a very hot topic, obviously, um, with the pandemic and not just uh, as it affects us but as it affects um, countries that we may be deployed to or working in uh, concert with. So, Roberto, any final comments you'd like to make? I know it was great to talk to you all and feel free to reach out to me on LinkedIn uh, if you have any questions, if I can help in any way. Awesome. Well, thank you everybody for attending. And uh, like John said, this will be available for viewing um, online and you could be able to share the link with other friends or colleagues that were not able to attend. Thanks. Thank you very much. Thanks, Roberto. Thanks, John.